I'm going to be speaking to you guys from the topic, Nutritional Facts, the Power of Your Worship. We're going to be focusing on Job chapter 1, verse 13 to 22. Church, there are countless songs that speak to the power of God to deliver, heal, and set free. Now, I'm not going to sing them because this is not talent, no talent night. And even if it was, I'll just pass the mic along to my daddy. You guys know I got my vocals from him. But you guys are all singers here today, whether in your own head or in reality. But songs that speak to God as a deliverer, songs like He's Able by Darwin Hobbs, which says God is able to do just what he said he would do. Don't give up on God because he won't give up on you. Or Every Praise by Hezekiah Walker. Now this song, I'm seeing every single person in the church get off to that. Only God my savior, God my healer, God my deliverer. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. You have the new kid on the block, Chandler Moore from Maverick City, with the song, Man of Your Word. Now, this song says all things are possible when we believe. All chains are breakable. If you said it, we believe it, because you're a man of your word. We all know this song by Tasha Cobbs Leonard. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. My favorite hymn, penned by Horatio Spafford, It Is Well, says, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say. You got it. It is well with my soul. Yes, church, there are many, many more. I can go on all day. I'm sure you could as well. But all of these songs speak to the fact that God's greatness is bigger than fill in the blank. All of these songs are on heavy rotation in churches around the world, and Shekinah is no different. But what we must realize, saints, is in order to, for us to get to that triumphant end, which is victory in Jesus, there's some stuff you got to go through. Now, we're all going through some stuff. Definitely got a witness there. See, before you get the victory, you've got to go through that journey, for there's no testimony without the test. And that, saints, we've got to learn what to do in the testing time. No one will escape life without going through something that could take you down. Matthew 5, verse 45, says that ye may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. If life has been a walk for you so far, well, as the super seniors will say, just keep on living. Now, many might not know this about me, but back in my day, back in my preteen days, and my dad could allude to this, I was pretty tidy at basketball. I had handles, I had a shot, and you wouldn't notice by looking at me now, but I had the endurance to play multiple games at both junior and senior level in the same day. Suffice to say, my favorite sport is basketball. Now, Reverend Steven, <laughs> you know where I'm going. A few years ago, there was a team in the NBA called the Golden State Warriors, and many people at that time, between the years 2015 and 2019, thought this was possibly the greatest team ever assembled. They were what they call a dynasty. They had won three titles in four years and were competing for their fourth title in five years, something that even the great Michael Jordan was never able to do in his prime. Blasphemy. One of the key members of this team was a man by the name of Clay Thompson, who was known for being a lethal three-point shooter while also being one of the NBA's top defenders. Clay Thompson was regarded at that time as one of the top 10 players in the league. Now, in 2019, when the Warriors were in the finals once again, Clay Thompson shot a relatively normal shot, but fell awkwardly. And in that fall, he tore his ACL in his left knee. Just like that. Season over, surgery needed, and nine months of rehab. Then comes the 2020 NBA season. He's involved in summer league workouts, on his way back to playing again, and then he injures himself once again. This time, he tears his Achilles tendon in his right leg. Just like that. Season over, surgery needed, another nine months of rehab. A major disappointment, not only to him as an individual, but to his team, as he was a vital piece to the championship puzzle of the Golden State Warriors franchise. A passionate and selfless player, left to watch games from the sidelines while rehabbing two possible career-finishing injuries, 
Clay Thompson spent 941 days away from the game of basketball. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody told me that I couldn't do the thing that I love for two and a half years, I don't know what I would have done. But hey, life could change in an instant, but what would you do? But somebody say, wait, it's not over. With me. After two and a half years of rehab, determination, and conditioning, Clay Thompson finally made his long-awaited return back to basketball once again this past year. And once again, the Golden State Warriors found themselves in the NBA Finals, which they won. Clay Thompson was again a major part of this team's success, and just last week, he won an ESPY Award. ESPY stands for Excellence in Sports Performance Yearly. He won the ESPY Award for Comeback Athlete of the Year, and the Golden State Warriors won the ESPY for the Team of the Year. Yes, a monumental achievement for both Clay and the team. Now, all of this, though, would not have been possible if not for that pit experience. Clay came back hungrier than ever, and with the joy, to, with the joy to once again be back where he was three years ago, because he had known what it was like to miss out on playing for so long. Now, how many of us, I'm going to ask the question again, would have heard the news of those injuries and simply bowed out and said, well, I've got my money, I've got my awards, I've got my accolades, I'm out. Not Clay Thompson. Clay was determined. He never lost sight of what he wanted to do, which was return to play the basketball, the sport that he has loved his entire life. That pitch situation tests your character. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. What does my test tell others about me? And more importantly, how does it reflect God in my life? Because truth is, even in your sorrows, God gets the praise. Now, Shekinah, no one knows more about how to worship while being in the pit more than our friend Job. Nobody knows how to have things taken from you in an instant and still being faithful to God more than Job. Shekinah, if anyone knew what Clay Thompson went through to seemingly have it all and to lose it all instantly, it was Job. Here was a man who seemingly had it all, only to lose what many would have thought was the source of his happiness. Even his friends would say that Job was a good man who didn't deserve the hand that he got dealt. But it's not the hand that you get dealt, it's how you play it. God doesn't say, understand me. He says, trust me. Let's take a look and see just how Job played his hand, how he worshipped while still being wounded as we look at the following three points. The pain the preparation, and the posture. Point one, the pain. Have you ever been mad with God because of different circumstances, life circumstances? Sometimes we can be faithful in church, attend all the meetings, come to Sunday school, serve the people while still being mad. I'm here to tell you that just because you are doing your God-given assignment, that does not make you exempt from the perils of life. Even the most diligent and faithful of servants can get their feelings hurt at some point in time. And that's what we have here with Job, a faithful servant of God who is also not exempt from the trials and tribulations of life. Now, if we read prior to the, uh, verse 13, we see that even God called Job special, saying there was no one else like him on earth, a perfect and upright man. Hearing this about Job, you could say that Job's character was the very reason he was given such a test. Yes, church, being caught of God does not give you the shield from the issues of life. So the question should never be, why me? As natural as that could be to ask, but rather, what would be my response? Let me tell you, church, your situation should never change your declaration. We see here in our text that Job is encountering problem after problem, all on the same day, which stems from God by the way of the devil. Always remember, God won't lead you to a roadblock that he hasn't provided a way of escape for already. Maybe this has happened to you. Maybe you could see yourself in Job's situation. I hope not. That's that serious. You are serving, doing all the right things, and then out of the blue, you get thrown offside. But let me just be real for a minute. Maybe you're either serving in church or serving someone in church, and they knowingly, or more often than not, unknowingly, do something to get you all up in your feels. And instead of approaching that person about it, you choose the easy way out and start acting out of character. No, no, church, that's not the time to turn your back on God or your God-given assignment, because there's a lesson in the pressing. 
Henry Kissinger once said, a diamond is a chunk of coal that did well under pressure. <laughs> you got it. Don't we aim to be like a diamond? Not collapse during the pressing time, but arise and overcome. Because we sing that song all the time too. I'm not going to sing it. But I am a warrior. I'm an overcomer. In the name of the Lord, yeah? In Philippians 3 verse 14, the apostle Paul wrote, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Shakana, as I said earlier, everyone has a journey to go through to get to their prize. How can we expect our walk to be any different then? That journey is one that could be filled with pain, heartache, headaches, sickness, but with the reward if we faint not. So I had to take it here because it's almost it, right? Somerset Cricket Club has a motto that says Semper Paratus, which means always prepared. And uh, Jay, you was all up in my sermon. Deacon is Tyra, where are you at? You was all up in my sermon too, thank you. Thank you for reading ahead. Church, that is how we should be in our Christian walk, always prepared. It's like when you was in school, Walk Academy, Class 2004, quote non ascendum, to what heights may we not ascend. And your teacher, back when you was in school, your teacher gave you those pop-up tests. And you was old man, you was like, what, man, serious pop-up tests? Well, you should have been studying and staying on top of your tasks all that time so that by the time you came to your, to your tests, you were just executing what you had been practicing all this time. Now, I've been a regiment soldier, conscripted for four years, back in my third year, huh? But doing the same drills, the same tactical um, practicing that we've been doing well, since I joined in 2009. Why do you ask? So when we got out on the battlefield, it's just a simple execution of what I know how to do all this time. The first week of your recruit camp is the most brutal week that you can experience. But that second, you got me Reverend Steve? But that second week, you're literally just exercising everything that you learned in that first week. The second week's a piece of cake. I'm not even gonna lie about that. But that's what Job was doing his entire life. He didn't just become a good and faithful man all of a sudden. As my dear friend Deaconess Joey Trot used to say, it's a lifestyle. This isn't just something you can just turn on and off like a light switch or take one and off like a coat depending on the temperature. It's not enough to just be in the building and body with your mind elsewhere. Like, okay, pastor, I'm reaching my God quarter for today. I'm trying to go out somewhere after this. Nah, that's not cool. Or what about when you're going out on a date with your significant other talking about, hey, babe, the good and say warriors are playing at nine. Um, we can speed this thing along. Doghouse, mate. I hope that thing is clean. God wants us to be in a relation with him. When you're in a relation, no matter what could come up, you remain focused on the assignment. And this is what Job teaches us here in this text. He's in relationship with God. And if we read further into the book of Job, we see all his friends, even his wife, trying to talk some sense into him. And you know how us Bermudians would be, we always tell all our East boys and this girl, they'd be like, hey, you're done. What are you saying right now? Like, you ain't serious, man. This is your God? Well, you could have him. Oh, you're wilding out, bro. Even Job's wife was telling him to curse God, but thank God for God's divine order. Because had God had things in reverse and the wife had covered her husband, the book of Job would have taken a very sharp turn and would probably stopped right there, right? Imagine one day, Job is offering praise and worship unto God, and the next day, his cattle struck by a lightning, servants gone, all his children dead, all these things that he was blessed with gone in an instant. Now, you want to talk about pain? But you know what I found interesting? In each verse here, and this, this is where Tyra was right on it, there was always one person who escaped to tell Job what they had seen. Whether it was one who told him about the loss of his ten children, or his 7,000 sheep, or his 3,000 camels, or his 5,000 yoke of oxen, or his 500 she-asses. There will always be someone that God will put in, your, in place to tell what they have seen. Now this person, or this person in each individual situation, didn't just tell the destruction around Job, but they were also a witness to Job's response. Now that survivor can witness to someone, now that survivor can witness to someone, who can witness to someone, who can witness to someone, who can witness to someone. Who in our lives is our person who escaped to witness our response to adversity? Will they be able to speak well of us as they did for Job? See, church, 
there is always someone watching our response to adversity. There's always going to be someone who has, and I told you so, but what would they be saying about you? Shikana, just speaking for me, there's, what, 18 cameras over there in the band area? There's three cameras over there. <laughs> <during with. laughs> there's three cameras over there um, on the keyboard area during the service, but none are more important than the person with the ultimate camera, where the batteries don't die, where there's no need for any upgrades, and he doesn't, <laughs> and he doesn't need anyone to operate them. Family, painful situations will come, but what would be your response? Job knew what had happened, but he didn't know why they were happening. Now, don't these things sound familiar? Lord, what did I do to you? I serve you faithfully, so why are you coming after me? And what about so and so? And when I was little, I used to think so and so was a person. What about so and so? They deserve this, so God, you gotta have this one wrong. All questions in our humanity that we might ask, but just as a reminder, God is the author and finisher of all things. Saints, we know the author of life. Nothing has happened here on earth that could be a surprise to God. You think God's sitting up in heaven like, cha? I didn't see that one coming. Dodge the bullet on that one. It's all a part of God's divine plan for our lives. We just have to remain faithful and trust his process. Like I said, God doesn't say to understand me. He says to trust me. I won't look here at anyone, so I'm just going to look at myself. Self, have you ever had life too easy and just became cocky in your own perceived success and then got met with a reality check? Many times, God puts us in those pitch situations to build character, and that character can be a witness to someone else who is going through something similar, who can then say, well, if Ryan could do it, then why can't I? If God's done it before, then surely he could do it again. Now, Pastor preached last week, Sometimes you have been put in places that are some pit situations. Sometimes you're cut deeper than you've ever been cut before, and it causes you to feel uncomfortable. But how many do I have here today that can testify that God put you there because that's the place you needed to be so you could rely totally on God himself? That's a place where mama can't help, daddy can't help, sister, brother, boo, bae, they can't help you. Just you and God and what you're going to do then. What are you made of in that situation? See, anybody can praise God when times are easy. And one of the most captivating stories in the Bible is the story of Paul and Silas when they were captured, put in prison, beaten to within an inch of their lives. And the Bible says in Acts 16, verse 25 and 26, And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. So that the foundation of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. Midnight, sure. Now, when we think of the word midnight, fancy, hey, you guys are one. When we think of the word midnight, we think of the darkest part of the day, but it's also actually the start of a new day. So this story shows us that whenever God is about to do something new in your life, it often in the darkest moment of your life. Darkness is an indication that something new is about to happen. Now, worship might not take you out of your situation immediately, but it frees you while you're still there. Psalm 150 verse 6 says, Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. It doesn't say let everything that have health, everything that have job, money, or house praise God. Church, when Satan attacks, he does this in the most effective way possible where it can hurt you the most, family, possessions. But what Satan didn't account for was that Job's faithfulness towards God was not wrapped in his earthly possessions. Job was faithful to God for different reasons than that, because like I said earlier, Job and God were in a relationship. This is why we should never idolize anything, not people, not material things, nothing. Because it can all be going in an incident, and just like that, you can have to ask yourself, will I still serve God? Always remember, saints, even in the pit, God is still there. The pain we feel comes to apply pressure so that we can come out of the pit situation like a diamond, which takes us to point number two, the posture of worship. Church, verse 20 starts off telling us, then Job arose. 
when reading and studying this text, the, that phrase struck me because it reminded me of those kind of like hint words, but or however. Just felt like something was about to happen. Something was about to turn around. Verse 20 says, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. To rent one's clothes means to tear with violent force or to be ripped, especially in manifestation of rage or grief. We see this in Genesis 37 verse 34, where Jacob rent his clothes while he was mourning for the loss of his son. Now, speaking of ripping, anyone remember the Hulk? So what happened when the Hulk got angry? He tore his clothes and transforced from Bruce Banner into the character of seemingly unlimited physical strength. So like Job and the Hulk, in our despair and weakness, can we actually gain strength in God? Yes, if you worship him. To shave your head was also a customary practice in those days of someone who was in grief. So you see here, Job was very much angry. Of course, he was a human. But in the text, it says he fell down and worshipped. Now, allow me to tell you guys a story. April 8th, 2020. The day my mom went on to eternity. Now, I'll tell you this. I don't think I've ever spoken this to anybody. But that day, I was mad, mad. Mad at God. Mad at the world. Worshipping God while I was mourning was the last thing on my mind. I went to sleep all day and basically sleep my problems away. So I convinced myself that the faster I went to sleep, the faster each day would go by. Now, anybody who knows me knows my daddy and I are boys. Like, that's my boy right there. But at that point, I wasn't anybody's friend. What made it worse that we were locked on, we were put in quarantine. And one day, I lost my mom. I wasn't allowed to go anywhere. Nobody was allowed to see me. It was at that point where I just really realized that I couldn't go anywhere, that I remember Pastor Seaman many years ago, saying to my mom, Julie, those challenging times go back to what you love doing. Soon after that, the church started having online services, and I was doing all the music for it. <laughs> no problem. In the studio, all day making tracks. Now, those who know me know that Ryan loves music, and especially gospel music. I mean, I grew up on that stuff. But I'll tell you what. I have never loved gospel music more in my life than in those couple weeks. If it were not for those worshiping moments in my studio, I don't know where I would be today. If I chose to stay in that dark place, Maui could have been my home, the graveyard could have been my resting place, but God. He always allows a way of escape. That's why my God will turn it around. It's not just a song, but it's also a testimony. Now, things will always begin to catch up when you worship. Now, worshiping doesn't mean that there aren't hardships, but your then moments shows that life is beginning to catch up to the worship that you have already put into the atmosphere. In verse 20, it says again that Job arose, and then the verse ends with saying that Job fell. So I'm saying to myself, why would he stand up to fall on again? Something just seemed odd about that. But the phrase to arise in scriptures is often used in the sense of beginning to do something. It does not necessarily mean to imply that Job was sitting. To arise actually means to be stirred up and to be prepared for action. So some would say today, Job got woke at this moment. In the Bible, we have 23, at least 23 different verses that talk about arising. Just a few. Genesis 13 verse 17 says, arise. Walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. First Samuel 23 verse 4 says, Then David inquired of the Lord yet again, and the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Kilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thy hand. This was a call to action. To arise was a call to action. Job was fighting his most difficult battle, and he knew he couldn't fight it alone why he fell to the ground and worshiped. Like I said earlier, Job's character is exactly why he was in this situation in the first place. God already knew what his response would be, and he used it for both Job's and God's good. In that moment, Job became a witness to those in his presence. Now, isn't that just like God? We don't always see it because we look at things from the surface, but God is more than capable of using our situations for good. So in that situation, Job was actually a gift. And because of that, Job was able to be blessed in his later years. 
many times we ask, why me? Why do I always get asked to do this task? Why do I always have to be the one to do it? But instead of question, just know that you are the gift. You have no idea who is watching you for what you're doing or what you're thinking. Because of Job's faithfulness to God, he didn't stay in mourning. He offered up worship unto God, which would be the precursor to Job's life changing for the better in the chapters to come. Which takes me to my final point, point three, the person. You may ask, well, if I'm going to go through these trials and hardships anyway, then why would I want to worship God? I'm glad you asked. Worshiping God renews your heart. It opens you up to experience the true joy in spite of your trials and gives you peace that surpasses all understanding. As you worship God more, you begin to cultivate a continual well of joy and peace in your life, no matter what comes your way. And in this life and times that we are living in, we ought to know that all other ground is sinking sand. There is no one who can do what God can do. As a musician, I've played at more funerals in the last two years than I care to remember. But just know that Matthew 5, verse 4 said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Psalm 30, verse 5 says, Weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now, I wish Deacon Sumner was here, because he'd be singing, I'm trading my sorrows, I'm trading my shame. And then somewhere, take the bus and go backwards and reverse and all it and say, I am pressed but not crushed. Persecuted, not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. <laughs> That's my boy. Church, when faced with adversity, we have to meet it with worship because tomorrow will never come if we take our permanent residency in today. Verse 21 says, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord taketh away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. What will we do between the womb and the tomb? Will we be overcome by the trials of life, or will we offer our praise unto God? The choice is yours. But one thing, whatever your choice is, does not change who God is. Job is able to worship because he knows God is the giver. Now, church, help me say this. God is the giver. Job was foolish. He could have said, man, you took away everything I had worked for, everything that was mine. But Job is actually acknowledging Thing he has was actually a gift from God. When he dies, it is not like he could take it with him anyway. Listen, if God can take something away from you that he gave you in the first place, then what makes you think that he can't give you something better in return? With God, there's always a better deal coming. You just have to trust the process and watch God perform his works. Yeah, there we go. Something I came across on Facebook a couple of days ago. You got a little girl, I can't, I'm not sure if you guys can see it, but you got a little girl holding a small teddy bear. And God's saying, just trust me. And the little girl's saying, but I love it, God. The caption says, trust God. What he has is way bigger and better. Thank you, guys. Now, will you trust God? Between your situation and your victory, what will you do? Job knew that God was still God in good and bad times, and this caused him to take up a posture of worship in spite of the pain, because Job knew that there was a purpose behind it. Saints, there is a purpose behind your suffering too, but you only realize it when you are in the will of God. Job worshiped while being wounded. He blessed the name of the Lord. To bless is to speak well of him, and the super scenes would say, hey, when you're sick, just call the name of Jesus until you feel better. Now, somebody here knows God to be a savior, a deliverer, a way maker. You know him to be Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Jehovah Rapha, our healer. Jehovah Nisi, who reigns in victory. And this is why we worship him in any situation. In the text today, Job kept his mouth, and he also kept his worship. Not to himself, but he didn't lose it in the battle. Now, church, I know some people are mourning not just in, in death, but also they have lost their joy, their jobs, money, will to fight, and seemingly lost their sanity. But that's just a good time to put praise in that situation and watch God do the rest. If you notice, 
Job didn't have an answer as to why he had suffered such tremendous loss. But what he did know was that in all things, God is in control. That's why we can't judge a person's praise and worship. Now, you don't know what that person's journey looks like. Now, if you want to look all nice and cute, then, hey, good on you. You could sit there like you're all that in a bag of chips. But if you open up a bag of chips nowadays, what's in that thing? It ain't chips. It's hotter. Now, we can't be that. Not in this day and age. Hotter Christians, part-time Christians. No, no, no. You're either fully in or you're fully out. It's like cup match time, for me, and you got, you got to pick a side. I don't care if you're a visitor or a tourist, never been to the game before, don't even know what cricket is. Somerset or St. George's, mate. If you're smart, you sure. <laughs> mate, that, you guys are crazy. I know that everyone has been saved here for a long time and probably forgets this song. But do I have some Al Green fans out there? Don't say it too loud. Oh, sure, you did, it, you did it too soon. Now, he sings about staying together, whether good or bad, happy or sad. Now, if I'm going to stay with a person, whether good, bad, happy or sad, how much more would I roll with God? He has never failed me yet. We think God works on our clock? Nope. Don't be afraid of the tests that come your way, because those are always intended to be part of your testimony. We never liked tests when we were in school but you didn't move on to the next grade if you didn't pass your course. I know someone who wanted a driver's license but was afraid to take the test. Well, how are you going to get the license if you don't pass your test? When did we start thinking that tests are meant to be avoided? As Christians, we face tests daily, but what is your response in the face of adversity? God gives his toughest test to his strongest soldiers. Now, I'm not saying to go out and just hope all bad things happen, and I know that would be foolish. But just like Job, adopt the lifestyle of faithfulness to God no matter what. Make worship a lifestyle, not just when it's convenient. Matter of fact, the most inconvenient times are probably the best times to worship Him anyway. Now, Shekana and those who are watching later or, or watching on Facebook Live, God in all situations deserves our worship. Now, I end this sermon history lesson. I've never been a huge fan of history, but I always like to know what's going on when these lyricists back in the day wrote all these beautiful hymns. So indulge me for a minute. Horatio Spafford was a successful lawyer and businessman in Chicago with his wife Anna and their five children. In 1871, their son died with pneumonia, and in that same year, much of his business was lost in a fire. Yet God later on in life allowed his business to flourish yet again. In 1873, Spafford's wife and four remaining children took an ocean liner to relocate to Europe. The husband planned to go, but at the last minute decided to stay in Chicago and finish up some business before joining them in Europe. The ocean liner that his wife and children took got into an accident and a short time later sunk in the Atlantic. Mrs. Spafford survived but her four remaining children did not. She was picked up by a sailor rolling a small, small boat who was looking for survivors. Mrs. Spafford was quoted as saying, God gave me four daughters, now they have all been taken from me. Someday I will understand why. Mr. Spafford sailed a few days later to hearing about the loss of his daughters, which left him at this point with no children, having lost his only son a few years prior. When the captain called Spafford, to his cabin and told him that they were now directly over the point where the boat had sunk. Spafford could not believe what he was looking at. It was a time when Spafford penned the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. Anna gave birth to three more children and their business was successful until the time of his death in 1881. I see, church, during our most challenging times, that's when we still offer up worship to God. Mourn for a season, yes but arise, because joy comes in the morning. Do not turn your back on God, because he will never turn his back on you. Last scripture for today, Philippians 4, verse 7, tells us that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Church, I'll leave you with this question. When you are wounded, will you still worship? God bless.